all the excitement about the United States presidential election may have deflected public attention from the worsening coronavirus situation around the world. Many countries in Europe are already taking drastic measures, including total lockdowns, as they battle a second wave of the virus. Remarkably, the United States, where it's all happening at the moment, remains the epicenter of the current COVID-19 resurgence. Here at home, the numbers of active cases have, has for a few weeks now been inching up following a brief period during which a sharp drop in active cases and fatalities was recorded. Both the Nigeria Center for Disease Control and the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 have been warning about a spike and they've been sounding alarm about this current wave. Ironically, at the same time, that the federal and state governments were lifting the ban on religious activities and also approving a graduated resumption of academic activities for primary and secondary schools. With COVID-19 threatening to swamp all of that with another wave, what can be the best recommendation for handling such a delicate situation? How effective have the health authorities been with contact identification, tracing, testing, and treatment? This and a lot more we'll be finding out from our guest, Professor Uyewali Tomori, a Nigerian professor of virology, and ed an administrator and former vice chancellor of Redeemers University here in Nigeria. Professor Tomori, good morning, and thank you for joining us on the morning show. Good morning, Dr. Abaji. It's a thank pleasure you. joining you. Thank you. Well, the last time you were on this program, you warned about the lackadaisical attitude of the people and also of the government uh, towards COVID-19. And you even predicted what could happen in the event of uh, a second wave. And uh, now that's been more than a month since we had that uh, conversation. What's your assessment of the situation in Nigeria right now, uh, given the fact that the country is beginning to open up on all fronts at a time when other uh, continents are shutting down and trying to be more careful? Uh, thank you, Dr. Abati. First, um, colleagues on the program. Uh, first, let me thank you for paying tribute to Barabi Musa. We need more of that in this country. Those are the people, the kind of character that will turn this country on the path of, 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 of success and progress. Now to COVID. Our attitude has not changed. We're still the same, like a Desica country. We're still the same country that have made up his mind not to take things seriously. So right now, we know, I mean, as we are seeing, the problem is, is now scaling up. The, the so-called drop that we said we had was not really correct. It was because we are testing less, and therefore we're getting less. Now we, we cannot hide behind uh, testing. Whether we test or not, we are seeing evidence of the cases. Secondary schools are opening. We have seen cases of foreign. I think there was one eighty one that was reported in a private school in Lagos. Uh, another six or seven have been reported. Kaduna State University also reported some. I just got a report that uh, one or two people in, in uh, correctional institutions in Cross River are also positive. So I think the deluge is coming. The tsunami is on the way. So we better get ready. Oh, dear, that sounds terribly ominous, sir. Now, Rufai here was markedly unenthused about the news of the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccine. I wanted to know your thoughts, bearing in mind, of course, that a vaccine on the horizon does not mean we should relax with our wearing of masks, social distancing and hand washing. But what are your thoughts on the Pfizer vaccine? I think it's good news. But remember, Pfizer was not the first. The Russians has also brought out one. And I think Moderna is bringing, hopefully, in another few days, we'll bring them more out. So there are three or four that within the next few months will be coming out. But when which one do we use becomes the, the issue. That's number one. I heard your report about um, in the Britain saying which of them are they going to use. Getting a vaccine is not the problem. The limit is going to be a major problem. As I said, it's a first step. It's good news that we're having this. Uh, this vaccine, as reported by Pfizer, um, I think Moderna will soon follow. The Russians have also has given their own a long time. They said that is ninety-two percent, and some of that nature. So, in another few months, we're going to get more vaccines out, which will be approved hopefully 
for use. Uh, none of them so far has not been gotten WHO approval, but at least we know that evidence we have for us is that these vaccines, the two that have been reported, are safe and efficacious. Right. Other countries are paying for vaccines, like the UK paid a sizable amount. In fact, there was a report released recently that said President Trump paid Pfizer a fast-track fee of about $2 billion, uh, for this same vaccine. But where does Nigeria stand in all of this? Other nations are paying. I've never heard that we have paid any commitment money as regards any vaccine in this country. Yeah, first of all, let me say that paying ahead of time is a good gamble because they actually paid before they even know what was coming out. But that's a proactive country, and that's the way things are done. You prepare ahead, uh, what we call preparedness, which we are not prepared. Uh, a few attempts have been made by Nigeria. The vice president had met with Pfizer uh, a few months ago, even before this came out. So we hope that uh, we don't know the outcome of that, but that's, that is that we've made the first step in talking with Pfizer. The Nigerian government, not even the other way, Russia came to Nigeria to ask us to join in their decision. I think there's a committee being set up by the government to look at the Russian, Russian vaccine and then what action we need to take. But concretely, I'm not too sure that we have, you know, put any amount of money forward. I know we joined the coalition for the car, the car COVID vaccine. I know we have joined the coalition, and countries who are members, I suppose, have paid some money up front. I don't know how much Nigeria has paid. Uh, we need to know that. But you know, we're in a country where there's a lot of secrecy over the important things, and therefore they might have paid, and they're not telling anybody. But we need to have that kind of information available to our people so that we know where we stand. Well, uh, Prof, in the um, UK, we have the Scientist Advisory Group for Emergencies, uh, called SAGE. And we have seen top scientists advising uh, the UK government, even if uh, Downing Street does not always take their advice. In the US, we have Dr. Anthony uh, Fauci, uh, who has been speaking of. Here in Nigeria, I read, you know, uh, that you are chairperson, chairman of uh, a scientific advisory group to the presidential task force uh, of Nigeria on COVID-19. Now, what has your group been saying to the Nigerian government in terms of the steps that they have taken? Is anybody listening uh, to the scientists or you feel handicapped uh, in terms of the responses from the presidential task force and the federal government? Thank you, Ruben. I think the first correction is that we are advising to the Ministry of Health, okay. not to the PTR. Okay. So, you know, so we have a few of you steps uh, behind, <laughs> behind PTF. PTF will probably not listen to us. They will listen to us through the ministry. And so there's a gap between us and PTF. But also, uh, I think you may, you have taken it from the last word you said about handicap. Yes, we are handicapped. Um, but let me be fair to the Ministry of Health. Uh, we've given as many recommendations on virtually every aspect of the COVID situation in Nigeria. Some of them have been, have been approved, I mean, uh, have been implemented. Others, uh, I think they still have to go through the PTF and so many other committees to get anything done. But again, to be fair to the ministry, there's an action plan which they have um, set up about COVID and what we need to do about that. In fact, yesterday, uh, on Tuesday at our meeting, we, re -look, we took a second look at that action plan on what step they are taking, what assumptions they made. And we found that the assumptions they made were okay. The implementation has been the major problem. Uh, like everything in the country, it's not that we don't have a plan. It is what we do with the, with the plan. You do remember that this federal government allocated some 100 million to some states uh, and then followed up with another one. The question in our mind is, why was that money given? Was it given for a specific purpose? Or was it given because this is national kick to be shared? Lagos got 10 billion. Oh, yeah. So, therefore, and then kind of follow with 5 billion. So, we too must get our billion. And is that the reason? Or is it for a common purpose? When the first 100 million was given to the states, what they were given specific things to do with it, nobody followed up about what they did with it. And then we, 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 we follow up with them by giving them a billion. And if they didn't account for the first 100 million, what guarantee do we have that we account for the 1 billion they got? These are the issues we're talking about. Uh, uh, things are given out to the, not for a specific purpose, but because of the desire of either the government or the people. 
That's where we have a problem. We give, we, we give uh, advice which nobody seems to follow. Or they pick and choose, instead of the advice, what suits them. Let me say what suits their pocket and not do this thing. I'll give you a good example. We had given some suggestion about many, many years ago about what and what Nigeria needs to do. So we said, take step one, take step two, take step three. Step three was the purchase and the procurement. They abandoned step one, they abandoned step two, and went straight to step three. Purchase what the, all the all the required to purchase because of the procurement and all that one without providing material, I mean, uh, resources to store what they have purchased. And so those things remain outside for years. These are the issues that we're dealing with in Nigeria. We don't completely implement. We implement what suits us. We implement what ends up in a mix of benefits our pocket, not the nation. Thank you, sir. Well, I'm a movie fanatic, and I can tell you that most disaster movies start off with the government ignoring the advice of scientists, and it always ends yeah. <laughs> appallingly. I wanted to talk to you about the second wave of the coronavirus, yes. which you have warned against. Are we taking the correct precautions? Because, as usual, it appears that the science has been drowned out by political and economic concerns. Is the coronavirus, as we're often told, being handled or managed better now, that people are more familiar? Because you obviously know better than me that it's a novel virus. When it hit the world this year, in January, a lot of people were taken aback. They were shocked by it. But now we've been told that the medical you know, practitioners are not, have a better handle of it so that the second virus will not, the second wave of a virus will not produce as many casualties, as many fatalities. Is that correct? Or are we going to see something more like the Spanish flu? And that second wave, which was more virulent than the first, and also H1N1 swine flu. Thank you very much for the, that background. I, I think you said it the right way. But let me put it this way. We're dealing with different epidemiology of COVID. What is happening in Europe has not happened in Africa. And we still believe that it's not likely to happen in Africa. Uh, the the, the uh, first wave, which you know, in, uh, in many African countries, we seem to have been having a drop down. We didn't see the kind of deaths and mortality that occurred in Europe for the various reasons, which people are still looking at. The, uh, the demographic, the age range, uh, and the fact that, you know, could there have been past infections in Africa with other related viruses. These are factors which I think are helping us, but does not mean that we see not having the, 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 the wave. We're going to get the wave. We're going to get, it may not be as high, uh, as high as it was, you know, in other parts of the world, but definitely the numbers are increasing. And we are seeing the evidence that numbers are increasing. And more, I mean, the, the, the students that are uh, cases occurring, the situation that are occurring in, um, in, our, in our correctional institutions, but at the same time, the virus will continue to behave as a virus. It is our behavior that determines to counteract the, the, the behavior of virus. If we do not, if our behavior does not help us in counteracting the virus, then it will only help us in uh, escalating the effect of the virus. We've abandoned those basic issues. I mean, go all over the world. I'm sure if you, if you go out yourself and you wear a mask now, you look like the crazy one out in the street. Yeah, the virus is still around. We know it's all over there. But yet we are still abandoning those basic things that will make a difference. And the things we should have done, yes, we made mistakes in the past, but we can correct our mistakes. We can't continue the same mistake and expect that, you know, COVID will go away. It will not. And again, I hope you'll be talking about the issue of vaccines, you know, for, for the country uh, okay. more than we are. <laughs> okay, Professor, I just want to, want to correct myself. In fact, uh, the initial uh, story I, I talked about that America paid Pfizer $2 billion was from uh, a, uh, a right-wing media, that was Fox News, that was saying the Trump administration had paid Pfizer $2 billion. But Pfizer came up with a statement saying that they had not collected any money uh, from the American government, you know, as regards the vaccine. But quickly, what I want to ask is this, Prof. I want to talk about the zero prevalence test. A couple of months back that they said was going to be done in a couple of areas, I think Gombe and Lagos and some other parts of the country. What's the result of that test? Because nobody seems to be talking about it any longer. It's, it's, it looks as though we've just forgotten it. Because if we had that zero prevalence test, we could have used it to plot a graph of probably if we're going to have a second wave on, or another. You know, how prevalent it would have been. So do you have any information on, the, on that report of the zero prevalence test conducted like two, three months ago? 
At a meeting we had, I think about two weeks ago, the NCDC did present that they had a proposal to test in three or four states um, uh, antibody uh, studies, you know, uh, seroprevalence. They actually said they've started, but I, would, I, I don't have any results. But also to say that together with the WHO, we at the, at the committee that we set up have actually had a, a more comprehensive proposal out, which would be a countrywide study. That, that required some support from the WHO. We submitted the proposal to WHO. We're also submitting the proposal to our own government to see you know, what we can. So, so far, we don't have any information about the prevalence of, of um, what the situation is in Nigeria. But we have evidence in other parts of, uh, of Africa. Kenya, for example, went through the blood donors and found out that about you know, 5 to 10 percent of the people have antibodies to, to, to the, the, the virus. Uh, which means they be able to say by extrapolation that they had more people actually got infected than reported by, by the test. I guess the same thing is going to happen in the country. But what we do is good to do the spots in different places to we'll find out information. But a comprehensive study will probably give us a better report. If you notice, most of the cases are coming either from Lagos or Federal Capital Territory or one other places. A lot of it uh, may be Kano. A lot of the other states are not even talking about the situation. So we need to go into those places, like, like uh, Kogi, for example, like Cross River, for example. We are hearing also, so they say they don't have, but we know they have. We have information that they have, but they are not passing that information. So data is a major problem here. And a zero prevalence, zero prevalence will help us in determining the burden of this disease in the different states of the country. But that is in the offing, but nothing yet has come out of it. It's plan, plan, plan but no implementation yet. Well, Prof, earlier on you said they're talking about the vaccine, and I think we should talk yes. about the vaccine. There is a race for the vaccine uh, across the world. Uh, countries are investing in it, uh, India, Russia, China, United States, UK, Germany, but I've not heard of any African country making an effort. And even Nigeria, um, the other day, the vice president uh, was supposed to have signed some kind of agreement with uh, Pfizer. We are also supposed to be part of the uh, COVAX alliance led by WHO and Gavi. Uh, have we made any commitment? Uh, has Nigeria paid any money uh, to try and get the vaccines? Uh, have you seen any indication that Nigeria is uh, thinking ahead proactively to make sure that uh, vulnerable uh, Nigerians like us are protected in the event of a vaccine uh, being produced. And do we even have the capacity in Africa to join the uh, vaccine race with all these laboratories they say we have? Thank you, Ruben. Uh, I think you, you're touching on very important issues which we should be actively and proactively involved. Uh, let me be fair to the government. They have made attempts. Uh, I did mention the fact that the vice president, you also mentioned it, Vice President was in discussion with uh, Pfizer. The Nigerian, the Russian government approached our Nigerian government on getting uh, their own vaccine. Um, in addition to that, uh, I think apart from Egypt and, and South Africa, no other African country was involved in the, in the clinical trials. So having said that, uh, we're making, we're taking steps, but as usual, to me, I think it's too slow and too little. Uh, the attempts we are making uh, are not even taking into consideration. For example, where we should start from is uh, how much how much of our people, what proportion of our people should be vaccinated? What number of doses do we need? These are calculations that should be going on at this time. But you can't do that when you don't even have the extent of the problem in your country. You don't know the, just like uh, Rufaya said, we don't even know the, the, the seroprevalence studies. What's the impact of how many people have been infected in the country? Those are the areas where we should start. These are where we should begin to see how many of our 206 million people should be vaccinated to have that proper herd immunity. What, what groups of people? Who, who are the, the, the priority cases? Is it the health workers? Is it the older people? Is it school children? These are information that we need to have even before we begin to pay for, for vaccines. And efforts are being made. We're looking into that one. For example, on my basic condition, if you have a vaccine that is 100% efficacious and has lifelong immunity, you need to vaccinate at least 60 to 80 percent of your mind in what you call the herd immunity so that you don't have any epidemic. But this is a disease we don't know yet. We know we have had 92, we have 90. We don't even know the duration of the problem. So if you do a calculation on maybe, say, 60 percent of our population, 
We're looking for 130, 100, up to 200, uh, 60 percent of 200, whatever, 120, about 150 million of Nigerians that should be vaccinated, you know, to provide the kind of health immunity that we want. Take wasted. Remember that you need two doses. So multiply that by two. You're looking at 250 million to 300 million. How much have we got? In? How much is Pfizer giving us? These are questions that we should be asking at this time. And we're asking, but we're not getting answers. And uh, th th these are, I think, the point. So being proactive means you do all those basic information ahead of time before you start even going into uh, blindly into working with COVAX or asking Russia on the other things. Again, we are providing the, that information and we're put, feeding it into the discussion that is going on. And hopefully, by the time, I think we have a meeting with the, the Russian group today, uh, this type of information will also be provided. How much is Russia ready to give? We don't know. And are we going to take what Russia is giving without having the full report of the phase three? Even the the uh, the Pfizer one that is going on, they have not completed their phase three already. I mean, uh, they have not yet completed their phase three. And we don't know uh, I, I'm not, how much of what where they gave figures about what they are producing already. But I'm, who have bought for that? We don't know. And so we need, it's we're just working in, Blindly in the confusion of that is going on. And then we need to begin now to refocus, open our eyes. What <coughs> needs to be done? Over. Thank you, sir. And speaking of questions, last month the United States National Governors Association sent quite a dizzyingly long list of questions to the Trump administration about how vaccines are to be administered. So even if Nigeria has the finances, the funding, even if Nigeria was to find itself at the top of the queue, what are the logistics? Because according to the current, you know, rave of the moment, the Pfizer vaccine, the, you need cold storage facilities to keep the vaccine below minus 80 centigrade. Even the Mayo Clinic in America, that prestigious hospital, has said that they don't have those kind of storage facilities. What chance do we have in Nigeria logistically? Can it be administered in your regular doctor's office, for example? Mm. <laughs> I'm laughing because I know you know it's not possible. But, but also to say that I was reading a report recently about a town in Hamilton, I think, somewhere in the U.S., in which they say they are not ready because they don't even have the cold facilities to store those things. So when I first read it, I thought they were talking about uh, Nigeria, but it's, Af it's America. So we are, that's why I said the point. It's not getting the vaccine. It's delivering the vaccine that is more important. Um, we see the effort of uh, uh, immunization coverage, or even the simplest and the easiest va vaccines to deliver at four degrees centigrade, which you can keep not to talk of going down to minus 80 degrees centigrade. How many freezers do we, even at minus 20, can we keep safe in, the, can we keep in, in, in Nigeria? So our problem is we're just starting when we get the vaccine, how to deliver. Uh, in, in, where in Lagos do you have any minus 80 degrees? Maybe in Naima or I don't know, where any other department that has a minus 80 degrees or something. You'll have that to import the, 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 the machine that will keep it at minus 80 degrees. How far are you going to put it? Is it going to be kept in Lagos? Is it going to be kept in Abuja? How, how, what about in my, my village? Well, even we don't have any a, a refrigerator. Now, these are the implications we are talking about. And we know issues about delivery of vaccines in Nigeria. What, what's our coverage? The basic vaccine that we give to our children, what's our coverage? We rarely eat 80%. You know, these are, these are some of the things that we need to begin to look at. Hopefully, we're hoping that this COVID thing will give us an opportunity to look at those errors of the past and see how we can improve and find the situation. Now, we're talking about COVID and vaccine or something. I'm sure you've been hearing reports now that there are outbreaks of diseases coming up in different parts of Nigeria. Yeah, I think it was Delta first, then there was Benue, and then or your state and a few others. This is the season for Lassa. Lassa is coming. But even when I'm told that what is coming out is not even Lassa. It's likely to be yellow fever. So when you compound that with COVID, you know where we are, a country that is totally unprepared, and totally unready for anything that needs to be doing for its own good. That's where we are. So uh, forget it. I mean, uh, the, the greatest thing there would be the logistics of delivering this vaccine. We're not even talking about that yet. Uh, all right. Uh, oh. uh, Professor, ju just for effect, the UK only yesterday has released the age range of the people that will get the vaccine first. Those over 65 yes. will get it before those in their 50s, and it keeps trickling down. And they have a plan for that. So that's yes. one part of it. The second leg of it for me is, are you comfortable 
Okay, with no proper peer review on all these vaccines before they are churned out. Just quickly, in less than a minute, Prof. Yeah, you see, first of all, I, I would say anything that does not get WHO approval, we shouldn't touch it. That's my home, because WHO goes through. Russia, I'm told, has submitted their detail to WHO. I expect Pfizer will do the same. There's a WHO committee that is involved in, in, in this. I'm in, with, we're involved with the Ebola. We go through the process of the initial. Up to now, we're not approved the Ebola because the data necessary are not there. So we need all that information, even before we begin to, to, to apply. I said getting this vaccine or paying for this vaccine is a gamble, but it's a gamble that we have to take. You know, that's the situation. I think WHO is working strenuously to see what is, whatever is coming out, what will be approved. And until I, I think Nigeria should stand on that, until we get that WHO approval of all these vaccines, we shouldn't touch any vaccine that is coming into this country. Over. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Yuvali <laughs> Tomori, for joining us on The Morning Show and for your thoughts, your insights, and the leadership that you continue to provide in trying to help Nigeria. Thank you very much.